Chapter 15 She Sailed Away Those nights were lonely, the old fire throwing into brightly, bright relief the boulders round about was company. I sat and stared into it for hours, and it used to trace such dancing patterns and pictures upon the boulders. One could conjure up any scene so long as the flames were not too bright to throw those flickering shadows. With a little cheery fire, enlivened by draughts stealing through the crevices, Roman armies and pharaoh's spearmen and camel trains and prehistoric things would march and glide across the boulders and fade away into the caverns. Fire must have been the prehistoric man's great friend, as it is the aboriginal's companion and helpmate today. In its friendship at night, he draws comfort and dreams things when alone, and in company plans things and gives his thoughts to others, and so grim night slips. by unnoticed. With it he smokes out his game, cooks his food, hardens his weapons, and burns out logs to make canoes. Not all the nights on the mound were silent. The surf breaking against the reef at the foot of the mound was deep rolling thunder until the tide came flooding in and cushioned the reef. I could picture that tide always from the sound could see it rising inch by inch, the clear reef breaking the waves and murmuring thunder, the growing harshness as the world tipped slightly over, and more water came rolling towards the reef. The deepening thunder as the world tipped farther, and still more water came rolling in. The angry boom as the reef tried its hardest to hold back that irresistible flow. Then the triumphant roar as the first massed waves broke right upon the reef and came broken and slathering and hissing across its broad surface to founder in sizzling foam. The continuous roar as reinforcements flung more massed water on top of the reef. The swirlings and hissings and whisperings as min minute by minute broken waves spilled farther across the reef and came creeping towards the mound. The sobbings, the sighings, and gurglings as eager, snaky arms gained the creek mouths and began rushing up. The gradually diminishing thunder as other waves fell on deepening water upon the reef to surge on over water into the creeks. Then at last only a crooning murmur when the tide was full and the great reef quite drowned. There were the very different sounds too, <clears throat> the much more lonely sounds when only very windy nights a vast murmuring would come sighing over the, the island from the mangrove forest. In gust it would come in sobbing shrieks that died away among the boulders. No wonder the legends of primitive man are full of ghostly things. I spent a little of each night straightening out and hardening the spear prongs bent daily by the big fish. Knowing how to sharpen picks made the tempering of the soft wire easy. Otherwise the prongs would have bent with every fish they struck. Surprising force is required to pierce the tough skin and scales of some fish. It must have been a wonderful discovery to Stone Age man when he found that by slowly heating his wooden spear prongs in the fire he could make them very hard. In life even the simplest thing has to be thought out or accidentally discovered, then by repetition done through bef thoroughly before success is assured. To harden the prongs each night meant only to hammer them straight, heat them nearly dull, hot, tip them a few seconds one inch deep in water, then plunge straight down and withdraw. It was a pleasure to watch by firelight the temper coming down and know a good job. Well done. I was independent even of a file to sharpen the points 
for this could be done with time and patience and heat and hammering and final grinding between two hard stones or better still by vigorous rubbing in a tiny groove of a huge boulder water sparingly added one morning i was on top of the mound when there was just sufficient wind to ripple the somber waters and send a chill through the threadbare shirt later clouds of drifting mist drove me farther in among the coldly sheltering rocks about midday my heart jumped painfully far out to sea was the blurred image of a mangrove tree where a tree should never be i leapt up staring with thumping heart lest the shifting mist blot the tree from sight a mangrove covered mud bank was to the east of the tree half an hour later the tree disappeared behind the bank oh the joy the tree was a moving sail beyond shadow of a doubt which way was she traveling she could not be a japanese bechdemer cutter for at that distance her sails would not be distinguishable the catch had the largest sails along that portion of the coast but it would be best not to assume it was the catch still something told me that it was a little later it came from behind the mud bank and slowly grew into two blurred sails slowly they drew closer gradually growing more distinct as the vessel that carried them drifted slowly west she was coming straight from the mainland from around cape melville tacking east and west that would bring her right here it was the catch the tide was on the turn it would be some hours yet before i could run to charlie with the news all that afternoon the catch tacked east and west ever coming closer closer often mist would hide her but sooner or later she would appear again ever more distinct towards sundown she showed up plainly gliding behind an island about four miles away she would anchor for the night now the sky had grown black there was no sign of charlie on the peak it sheltered his camp from the sea so as he rarely climbed it he would not know the catch was coming picturing his delight i ran splashing along the reef it was nearly sundown charlie was crouched over his galley fire eating fish i was shocked his unkempt hair and beard had grown so his deep sunk eyes had lost their wildness charlie the catch is coming how do you know he growled because i've been watching it all day i'll let it come but it will take us off it won't take me off yes it will the weather is calm a dinghy on land no dinghy will land whether or not they won't take me off i sat down don't you want to go no heavens man what is the matter with you nothing is the matter with me while well, i'm going thank heaven this is my last night on this wretched island he said nothing just kept munching while staring into the fire i was hard it was hard to know what to say to all protestations to every point of view he only grunted in reply I was too delighted to care a great deal. The catch was there, and Charlie would change his mind in the morning. Presently, he stood up and walked into the tent, tying closed the door. I was too absorbed by thought of the catch to notice whether he was working up for a bad turn or just recovering from one. Be ready in the morning, I called. The tide will be out, and I'll be over here at daylight. Have all your things ready in case a wind springs up after dawn. You attend to your own affairs and don't bother about mine, he growled from the tent. I walked back to the reef and the mound, whistling cheerily. It was chilly, but through the mist, stars at times shone brightly. Perhaps tomorrow would be a fine dawn. Occasionally a big crab scuttled across the reef. It was a pleasure to let them live. Sleep heartily came at all that night. Before dawn, I was gazing seaward from the mound. There was no sign of the sun. Sea and sky were overcast with swiftly traveling banks of black cloud. A light wind, icy cold, sent chill breaths of ghostly sleet gusts through and through one. With the graying of dawn, I hurried along the reef to the peak. 
even from its summit, visibility extended barely a mile to sea. Soon the sun would drive these blinding mists away. An hour later, and Charlie appeared, noiselessly glaring out to sea. Where are your blanket and things? I cried. Won't want them. She won't land. I could have kicked him. Of all the Jonas I've ever met, you are the worst, I protested. Why won't she land? Look at the weather. Looks black, but it's not rough yet. They'll land all right. He sat down, staring out at the mist, his bony knees clasped nearly under his chin, his deep-lined face and haggard eyes a picture of brooding misery. A week in Cooktown, and we won't know one another, I ventured. How would a bath and a shave and clean clothes and a good feed at the West Coast Hotel go down now? You're counting your chickens before they've hatched, he replied soberly. We sat there silently. An hour later and a weak, hovering shaft of light shot up over Lizard Island to be immediately swallowed by the mist. Charlie stood up, turned, and began climbing down the peak on his campsite. Don't leave anything behind, I called. Not that we've got much to leave behind anyway. He stopped and looked back, his expression more chilly than the mist. Then he turned and slowly descended the peak. You'll just about get on the catch in time, Charlie, me lad, I muttered. It's a cot in hospital for you when we reach Cooktown. And for you too. Talking to yourself is the first stage. I felt a bit frightened. More rays of light came, stronger this time, more slowly swallowed up. The mist began to lift tor away towards the mainland. The blanketing clouds began traveling towards the north. Then the crest of Lizard Island shot out from blackness, illumined by a ball of shimmering light. Long, fiery arms shattered the mist into tremulous coils of fleecy vapor. Westward, the mist was lifting. I yelled and waved as the catch's two big sails stood out lily-white through the thinning mist. She was hardly three miles away, if that her framework stood out plainly under a shaft of sunlight. What currents or drift must have taken her farther back. She was facing the island now and would pass it quite close if a wind did not spring up. I felt tempted to run back to the mound, waited for a while. She was barely moving. She was stationary now. The faint gust of breeze had dropped to a calm. The sun shone in fitful bursts of light. Suddenly, the sky darkened as black clouds rolled low down over the sea. Then a breeze came and a blaze of sunlight. The sea rippled, and the catch began to surge on straight for the mound. I could stand it no longer, but ran down the peak and out onto the reef, running to the mound. The catch was forging down the channel. She would pass the mound only a few hundred yards distant. I took off my tattered shirt and waved frantically. Then the cursed mist came down and blotted from view, catch and sea and everything. I yelled wildly, knowing that the catch would shear away from the reef, a death trap in the mist. Would she go straight on? She could not anchor. The water was too deep. With the great reef nearby, in Coquay Island and other reefs, she was in a nasty position. At last the mist cleared again, and there the catch was a mile away from the mound. And heading towards Coquay Island, I could have howled. But what a relieved man the skipper must have been. Near Coquay, her sails came tumbling down, and the anchor chain rattled companionably. In brilliant sunlight, I started to hurry back to the peak when Charlie appeared, cautiously climbing the peak. Even at the, that distance, something in his stealthily climb made me stay on top of the mound and watch him. When near the top of the peak, he crouched and did not show himself. I wonder why. It didn't matter. The breeze had fallen to dead calm again. The catch could not move. As soon as the tide began coming in, she would send a dinghy ashore, time so that it could row over the reef with the tide. We should have, we should be taken aboard, and the catch would drift away with the strengthening tide if there was no wind. It was almost unbearable sitting there, waiting, staring towards the distant catch as the mist came and went. At last the tide began coming in. Faintly came the distant rattle of pulley blocks. I jumped up, ready to run along the reef to the lagoon. Up went the sails, and slowly they filled. She was going to drift in with the tide as close to the island as she dared, 
then lower it again. Slower, the catch began to creep ahead. I stood on a rock and waved the last of my shirt. But again, the mist came down and blotted out Coquet Island, blotted out the catch, blotted out the sea. How I cursed it. Slowly the mist lifted, and there were the big sails of the catch bellowing under a growing breeze. Miserably, I saw the jib sail taunted out where the stern should be. The catch was sailing south on the return tack to Cooktown. All the yelling, all the arm waving in the world would not bring her back. Long afterwards, I met the skipper, and he explained that Charlie had definitely instructed him that there would be no need to send a boat ashore unless a well-defined signal called him. <clears throat> Otherwise, he was to know that some passing Bechtemere boat had picked us up or left us more provisions. Charlie had brought lots of vegetable seeds in his swag. He meant to start a garden, keep fowls, and to bring goats from Cooktown. His idea was to be utterly cut off from and independent of the world. Why he had shown me the ten specimens and encouraged me to go with them, I never learned. His oversight <clears throat> and forgetting his scope and chemicals in Cooktown had no doubt deranged both his plan and his reasoning. I nearly went crazy when the catch sailed away. To save reason, I picked up the old Malay's logbook of the sea foam. As the days drifted past, jotted down the diary from which the story is written. I erected a flag of distress up on the lookout, sacrificing the precious blanket, keeping only the rug. The flagpole was a long bamboo washed among the rocks. A cairn was already erected. I worked for hours making it still higher, then lashed the blanket to the bamboo flagpole and buried its butt deep in the cairn. Any breeze would turn the blanket into a flag visible far away. Passing steamers and purling luggers could not fail to see it. An occasional vessel saw it and passed on to my bitter, bitter disappointment. I did not realize that the flag was taken for that of a Bechtemere fishing station. There were a few such up along the coast. The cutters would bring their fish to the island depot to be smoke cured. They would load with wood and water, then the vessel would sail away to its fishing grounds. The men or man on the island would later signal from a hill when he was ready to cure more fish or when some other vessel of the fleet had called in with supplies. A flag like that high upon a peak is visible for many miles to sea. Several steamer captains and purling men long afterwards told me that they had seen the signal and had very naturally in such circumstances put it down to a Bechtemere station signaling her cutters away out on the Great Barrier Reef.